My sister raised me after our mom left, then abandoned me for her boyfriend. Years later, she wants to reconnect but I discover a shocking family secret. I'm Samantha, 21F, and I need to share my complicated family history and current dilemma. My older sister, Kimberly, 29F, basically raised me from when I was 5 years old. Our mom, Karen, 50F, left us to escape our controlling and manipulative father, Sean, 52M. Growing up, our house was always tense. Sean worked as a sales manager for a local car dealership, and he brought his aggressive sales tactics home with him. He'd use guilt, shame, and manipulation to get his way. I remember being four years old and wanting to wear my favorite purple dress to preschool. Sean insisted I wear the outfit he'd picked out, a stuffy, uncomfortable ensemble that made me look like a miniature businesswoman. When I started crying, he told me I was ungrateful and that I'd never succeed in life if I couldn't even dress properly. Kimberly stepped in, telling him it was just preschool and letting me wear what I wanted. That earned her a week of silent treatment from Sean. Kimberly bore the brunt of his behavior, often stepping in to protect me from his harsh words and unreasonable demands. She'd distract me with games or stories when Sean was in one of his moods, which became more frequent as time went on. Our mom, Karen, tried to mediate at first. I have vague memories of her attempting to reason with Sean, of hushed arguments behind closed doors. But Sean's manipulation extended to her too. He'd alternate between love bombing her with grand gestures and gifts, and tearing her down with subtle jabs about her appearance or intelligence. One day, when I was five, I woke up and Karen was gone. Sean told us she'd abandoned us because we weren't good enough. It wasn't until years later that we learned the truth, she'd been planning her escape for months, squirreling away money and making arrangements. She left in the middle of the night, thinking it would be easier on us if we didn't have to say goodbye. In reality, it left us with years of abandonment issues and unanswered questions. After Karen left, Sean's drinking problem, which had always simmered beneath the surface, boiled over. He'd come home from work and immediately crack open a beer. One beer turned into a six-pack, then hard liquor. His moods became even more unpredictable. Some nights he'd be maudlin, crying about Karen leaving. Other nights he'd rage, blaming us for driving her away. Kimberly, only 13 at the time, stepped up in ways no child should have to. She learned to cook simple meals, did laundry, and made sure I got to school on time. She'd help me with homework, read me bedtime stories, and try to shield me from the worst of Sean's behavior. When I was eight, Sean's drinking spiraled out of control. He lost his job at the dealership after showing up drunk one too many times. He started staying out late, coming home reeking of alcohol and cigarettes. One night, he didn't come home at all. We later found out he'd been arrested for drunk driving and resisting arrest. Child services got involved, and Kimberly, who was 16 at the time, fought tooth and nail to keep us together. She convinced our aunt, Sarah, 45F, to take us in temporarily. Sarah was kind but struggled with her own issues, she was a recovering addict herself and worked long hours as a nurse. So even in Sarah's house, Kimberly continued to be my primary caregiver. I remember the day Kimberly won custody of me. She was 18, barely an adult herself. We moved into a tiny studio apartment in a not-so-great part of town. It was all we could afford on Kimberly's meager salary from her multiple part-time jobs. But that little apartment became our sanctuary. Kimberly painted the walls a cheerful yellow, hung fairy lights, and created a cozy reading nook for me in one corner. She'd work long hours, but always made time to help me with homework or just talk about my day. Life wasn't easy, but we were happy. Kimberly made sure I stayed in school, helped me with homework, and tried to give me as normal a childhood as possible. We'd have movie nights, go to the park on weekends, and she even saved up to take me to a local amusement park for my 13th birthday. I remember that day so clearly, Kimberly had dark circles under her eyes from working extra shifts to afford the tickets, but she smiled the whole day, laughing with me as we rode roller coasters and ate too much cotton candy. However, things took a turn when Kimberly met her boyfriend, Ryan, 30M, when I was 14. At first, he seemed nice enough. He'd bring us takeout, help Kimberly with some bills, and even took us both to a baseball game once. But as he spent more time at our apartment, I noticed changes in Kimberly. She started drinking more, often coming home late or not at all. There were nights when I'd be left alone, scared and hungry. I remember one particularly bad night. I was 15, and Kimberly had promised to help me prepare for a big history presentation. But she never came home. I stayed up all night, alternating between working on my project and worrying about her. When she finally stumbled in at dawn, reeking of alcohol, I was too relieved to be angry. I helped her to bed and then went to school, exhausted and unprepared. I bombed the presentation. One day, I overheard a heated argument between Kimberly and Ryan. 
He was pressuring her to kick me out, saying I was holding her back from living her life. You're not her mother, he yelled. You've done your part. It's time to live for yourself. To my shock and heartbreak, Kimberly didn't defend me. She just cried and begged him to give her more time. A week later, Kimberly sat me down and told me I'd be going to live with our Aunt Sarah again. She said it was temporary, just until she figured some things out. I was devastated and felt utterly betrayed. The sister who had always protected me, who had fought so hard to keep us together, was now choosing her boyfriend over me. Living with Sarah wasn't terrible, but I missed my sister desperately. Sarah tried her best, but she worked long hours and was often too tired to do much more than ensure I was fed and had clean clothes. Months went by with only sporadic texts and calls from Kimberly. Each time, she promised to visit or to bring me home soon, but it never happened. Then, on my 15th birthday, I received a bombshell of a message. Kimberly told me she'd been in contact with our mom, Karen, for years. Apparently, Karen had been sending money to help support us, and now she wanted to reconnect. The betrayal I felt was indescribable. All those years of feeling abandoned, of wondering why our mom had left us, and Kimberly had known where she was? I felt like my whole world had been built on lies. In a fit of anger, I blocked both Kimberly and Karen's numbers. For the next three years, I focused on school and building a life for myself. I got a part-time job at a local bookstore, joined the debate club, and tried to move past the hurt. Sarah, despite her flaws, was supportive and gave me the space I needed to heal. She never pushed me to reconnect with Kimberly or Karen, but always left the door open if I wanted to. I threw myself into my studies, determined to win a scholarship to college. Late nights of studying, weekends spent on extra credit projects, and summers filled with advanced courses paid off. I graduated high school as valedictorian and won a full ride to a good state university. Now, at 21, I'm in my third year of college, majoring in psychology with a minor in social work. I've made good friends, joined a support group for people from dysfunctional families, and even started dating a kind, understanding guy named Alex, 22M. Last week, I ran into Kimberly at a local coffee shop. It was awkward and tense. She looked different, older, tired, but somehow more put together than I remembered. She asked if we could talk. She said she's no longer with Ryan, has been sober for two years, and wants to rebuild our relationship. Part of me misses my sister terribly and wants to give her another chance. I remember the Kimberly who raised me, who sacrificed so much to keep us together. But another part of me is still angry and hurt by her choices. The abandonment, the lies about our mom, choosing Ryan over me, it's a lot to forgive. I don't know if I can trust her again or if I even want to try. What if I let her back in and she hurts me again? But what if this is our chance to heal and have the relationship we used to have? I'm torn between my lingering love for my sister and the need to protect myself from further hurt. Am I wrong for being hesitant to let Kimberly back into my life? Should I hear her out, or continue to keep my distance? Update 1, it's been a month since my original post, and a lot has happened. I want to thank everyone for their advice and support. After much consideration and encouragement from my boyfriend Alex and my therapist, I decided to meet with Kimberly to hear her out. We met at a neutral location, a quiet park near my college campus. As I waited on a bench by the duck pond, I felt a mix of anxiety and anticipation. When Kimberly approached, I barely recognized her. She looked healthier, more put together than I remembered. Her hair was neatly styled and she wore a simple but professional outfit, a far cry from the disheveled, party girl look I remembered from our last encounters. As soon as she saw me, her eyes welled up with tears, but she respected my wishes to keep some physical distance between us. We sat on opposite ends of the bench, the space between us a physical representation of the emotional chasm we needed to bridge. Kimberly started by apologizing profusely for her past actions. Her voice shook as she spoke, and I could see the genuine remorse in her eyes. She admitted that getting involved with Ryan was the biggest mistake of her life. She explained how he had slowly isolated her from friends and family, encouraged her drinking, and manipulated her into prioritizing him over everything else, including me. She told me about the night she decided to send me to live with Aunt Sarah. Ryan had come home drunk and angry, ranting about how I was ruining their lives. He'd thrown a bottle against the wall, shattering glass everywhere. Kimberly said she realized then that our home wasn't safe for me anymore, but instead of leaving Ryan, she convinced herself that sending me away was the best solution. After I left, things with Ryan got worse. He became physically abusive, and Kimberly fell deeper into alcoholism. She lost her job, then their apartment. For a while, they lived out of Ryan's car, bouncing between friends' couches and cheap motels. It wasn't until she ended up in the hospital after a particularly bad fight that she finally found the strength to leave him. 
A kind nurse helped her check into a rehab facility, where she spent three months getting sober and starting to deal with her trauma. Since then, Kimberly has been rebuilding her life piece by piece. She's been working as a paralegal for the past year and is slowly saving up to go back to school. She's also been attending AA meetings regularly and seeing a therapist to work through her issues. Then came the part I was most anxious to hear about, our mom. Kimberly broke down as she told me the full story. Apparently, Karen had been trying to escape our father for years before she finally left. She was scared that if she took us with her, Sean would hunt her down. So she left us behind, thinking we'd be safer with him than on the run. Karen had reached out to Kimberly when she turned 18, offering financial support. Kimberly said she was angry at first but eventually accepted the help to provide for me. She kept it a secret because she was afraid I'd want to leave her for our mom, whom she still didn't fully trust. Kimberly also shared some of Karen's story. After leaving us, Karen had moved across the country, changed her name, and slowly built a new life for herself. She'd gone back to school, become a teacher, and even remarried. But she never stopped thinking about us and trying to find a way to make amends. Hearing all this was overwhelming. I had to take a few days to process everything. Part of me understands the impossible situations both Kimberly and Karen were in, but another part still feels betrayed. The rational side of me knows that trauma and abuse can make people make desperate choices, but the emotional side still hurts from the abandonment and lies. After a week of reflection and a long session with my therapist, I decided to take small steps towards rebuilding our relationship. Kimberly and I have agreed to meet once a week for coffee. We're also going to start attending family counseling together. I've made it clear that I'm not ready to fully trust her yet, but I'm willing to try. As for our mom, I'm still not ready to connect with her. The wound of her leaving is still too raw, despite the years that have passed. Kimberly understands and has promised not to pressure me about it. She's agreed to keep her relationship with Karen separate from ours for now. This is just the beginning of a long journey, and I'm still cautious. There are moments when I look at Kimberly and see the sister who raised me, who protected me from our father's rage and made sure I always had enough to eat, even if it meant she went hungry. But there are also moments when I remember the betrayal and abandonment, and I have to fight the urge to run away and protect myself. But for the first time in years, I feel a glimmer of hope that I might have my sister back in my life. It won't be easy, and it won't be quick, but I'm willing to try. I'll keep you updated as things progress. Thank you all again for your support and advice. It really helped me find the courage to take this first step. Update 2. It's been three months since my last update, and I wanted to share some significant developments in my family situation. Kimberly and I have been consistently meeting weekly for coffee and attending family counseling. It's been a roller coaster of emotions, but we're slowly making progress. There have been tears, arguments, and moments of connection. Our therapist has been helping us navigate our complex feelings and establish healthy boundaries. In one particularly intense session, we delved into the night Kimberly sent me to live with Aunt Sarah. I finally told her how betrayed and abandoned I felt, how it brought back all the pain of our mother leaving. Kimberly broke down, admitting that she's never forgiven herself for that decision. We both cried, but it felt like a weight had been lifted. Being able to express those feelings and have them acknowledged was cathartic. We've also had lighter moments. Last week, we went to our old favorite ice cream shop. As we sat there, laughing over ridiculous Sundays like we used to, I caught a glimpse of the sister I remembered. It wasn't all bad memories between us, and it's been nice to reconnect with some of the good ones too. However, about a month ago, during one of our sessions, Kimberly dropped another bombshell. She confessed that she's been in contact with our father, Sean. Apparently, he reached out to her six months ago, claiming he's changed and wants to make amends. I was furious. The thought of Sean being back in our lives filled me with anxiety and dread. I stormed out of the session and didn't speak to Kimberly for a week. During that week, I had nightmares about Sean. In one, I was a child again, cowering as he loomed over me, his words cutting deeper than any physical blow could. When I finally calmed down enough to hear her out, Kimberly explained that she hadn't told me immediately because she wanted to verify Sean's claims first. She'd been cautiously communicating with him, and even met him once in a public place with her sponsor present. According to Kimberly, Sean has been sober for two years. After hitting rock bottom, losing his job, his home, and ending up in jail for a DUI, he finally sought help. He's been attending AA meetings, seeing a therapist, and trying to turn his life around. He expressed deep remorse for his past actions and wants to apologize to both of us in person. I was conflicted? On one hand, I have no desire to see Sean ever again. The memories of his emotional manipulation and the chaos he caused in our lives are still raw. I remember the constant fear, the walking on eggshells, never knowing what would set him off. On the other hand, a tiny part of me is curious about whether he's truly changed. 
and an even smaller part, a part I'm almost ashamed to admit exists, still yearns for a father's love and approval. After much deliberation and discussions with my therapist, I've decided not to meet Sean, at least not now. I told Kimberly that while I respect her choice to have a relationship with him if she wants, I'm not ready for that step. She understood and promised to respect my decision. This situation has brought up a lot of unresolved feelings about our childhood. I've started individual therapy to work through these issues, which has been challenging but helpful. I'm learning to recognize the ways our upbringing has affected my relationships and behavior patterns. As for my relationship with Kimberly, we're still working on it. There are good days and bad days. Sometimes, old resentments bubble up, and we have to take a step back. Other times, I catch glimpses of the close bond we once shared, and it gives me hope. Last week, we had a particularly good day. Kimberly came to watch me give a presentation for my psychology class. Seeing her in the audience, smiling encouragingly, reminded me of how she used to attend all my school events when we were younger. Afterwards, we went for coffee, and she helped me brainstorm ideas for my next project. It felt nice, almost like old times. But then yesterday, we had an argument when I found out she's still in regular contact with Sean. I felt betrayed all over again, like she was choosing him over me. We're working through it, but it's a reminder that this journey isn't going to be smooth sailing. I'm learning that healing isn't linear. It's okay to have conflicting feelings and to take things at my own pace. I'm proud of the progress I've made, but I know there's still a long way to go. Thank you all for your continued support. I'll update again if there are any major changes. Update 3 It's been six months since my last update, and I felt it was time to share some final thoughts on this chapter of my life. Kimberly and I have continued our weekly meetings and therapy sessions. While our relationship isn't perfect, it's significantly improved. We've had some breakthroughs in understanding each other's perspectives and have started to rebuild trust. One of the biggest breakthroughs came during a therapy session where we discussed our childhood roles. I realized that I had always seen Kimberly as a parental figure, which made her abandonment feel even more painful. Kimberly, on the other hand, expressed feeling overwhelmed by the responsibility thrust upon her at such a young age. This conversation helped us both see each other more clearly as sisters, rather than as a pseudo-parent and child. About two months ago, I finally agreed to meet our mom, Karen. We met at a small cafe, neutral ground for both of us. Karen looked older than I expected, with streaks of gray in her hair and lines around her eyes that spoke of years of worry and regret. It was a tense and emotional encounter. Karen tried to explain her reasons for leaving, but I found it hard to accept her justifications. However, seeing her obvious remorse and hearing about the abusive relationship she endured with Sean gave me a new perspective on our family history. Karen shared more details about her life after leaving us. She'd spent years in therapy, working through her trauma and guilt. She showed me pictures of her new family, a kind-looking husband and two young kids, my half-siblings. It was strange to think I had siblings out there I'd never known about. I've decided to maintain limited contact with Karen for now. We text occasionally, and I've agreed to meet her once a month. It's a slow process, but I'm giving her a chance to be part of my life again. Last week, she came to one of my debate competitions. Seeing her in the audience, next to Kimberly, stirred up complicated emotions, but it also felt oddly right. As for Sean, I'm still firm in my decision not to see him. Kimberly respects this and doesn't push the issue. She continues to have a cautious relationship with him, which has caused some tension between us, but we're learning to navigate these differences. I've made it clear that I don't want to hear updates about him unless it directly affects my safety. The biggest change has been in my own personal growth. Through therapy and self-reflection, I've come to terms with a lot of my childhood trauma. I'm learning to set boundaries, express my feelings healthily, and prioritize my own well-being. I've realized that it's okay to love my family while also protecting myself from potential harm. I've also made some positive changes in my life. I've joined a support group for adults from dysfunctional families, which has been incredibly helpful. Hearing others' stories and sharing my own has been both healing and empowering. I'm excelling in my studies and have even started interning at a local counseling center, which has reinforced my desire to pursue a career in psychology. My relationship with Alex has grown stronger through all of this. His unwavering support and understanding have been a constant source of comfort. He's been patient when I've needed space and supportive when I've needed encouragement. Looking back at where I was when I first posted, I'm amazed at how far I've come. I'm not naive enough to think all our family issues are resolved, but I feel more equipped to handle them now. There are still hard days, days when old fears and resentments resurface. But there are also days filled with laughter, understanding, and hope. To anyone out there dealing with similar family trauma, I want to say, healing is possible. It's not easy, and it doesn't happen overnight, 
but with time, effort, and the right support, you can build a life you're proud of.